So, uh, this is the last segment of the chapter on chemical admixtures. So, in part 8, we looked at mechanisms of corrosion, use of corrosion inhibitors, shrinkage reducers, SBR latexes and other specialty chemicals that are added in specific situations. Uh, today, we will talk about the final part of the chapter that is curing compounds. Now, to understand curing compounds, one has to understand what impact curing has on the overall durability of the concrete. Now, if you really think about durability, you can separate that out into two aspects. One is the concrete system itself, the other is the aggressiveness of the environment. Concrete has to be designed specifically to undertake or to perform satisfactorily in different environments. You can have a chloride exposure environment, carbonation environment, sulphate environment and so on and so forth. Right? Several different mechanisms can make these aggressive agents attack concrete and deteriorate concrete in one way or the other. The concrete system itself is composed of your materials, that is the different types of binders, amount of binder, the aggregates that are used, admixtures, mix design and so on. But then you also have the process of actually manufacturing the concrete or putting it in place inside a structure. That involves your entire process from mixing, transportation, compaction and curing is absolutely an important strategy to ensure that you are able to produce concrete of the right strength and durability inside the structure. It is not just enough to have good quality concrete in cubes that you store in ideal conditions, but the actual concrete in the structure should also have the right kind of mechanical properties and durability properties. There are other aspects that can also affect the concreting that is temperature and workmanship, but here our focus is on looking at curing. If you think about a typical reinforced concrete member like a reinforced concrete column for instance, which is primarily working from the principles of compression. right? So, the concrete is contributing significantly to the overall compressive load carrying capacity of the column. right? Now, the steel also contributes to some extent, but more likely the steel is there to help with any bending that may happen because of eccentricity of the load. If the load is completely axial, it is obviously concrete which is bearing most of the compressive load that is happening on this column. Now, if you think about separating the concrete out into two parts, the part which is inside the steel and part which is outside the steel. The part that is outside the steel we commonly call as our cover and the cover concrete is otherwise termed as cover crete. Okay? The part that is inside is the bulk of your concrete because your cover typically depending on the environment could be as as high as 30 to 75 millimeters, but what is inside if you have a 200 by two, uh, 200 column let us say, a large chunk of the concrete will be inside the reinforcement right? and that you can term as hardcrete. So, most of the contribution to the strength is coming from this hardcrete, what is inside, what is present in the large quantity and so on, that is contributing maximum to the strength of your concrete structure or the column in this case. right? The external part which is protecting the reinforcing steel is protecting it from corrosion. So, the durability is contributed primarily by the cover crete. Now, when you do curing, it is the quality of the cover crete that you are trying to improve. Okay. You are not doing curing to increase the strength of this internal part of the concrete because if you can't, you cannot imagine a condition in which the water from inside will dry out, it is not going to happen because there is sufficient amount of concrete on the outside, the hardcrete is perhaps not going to get subjected to any drying. The external chemicals that are entering the concrete are going to deteriorate only the covers, cover region and not really the inside part. So, truly speaking, if you do not do curing, you are more likely to impact the, you are not likely to impact the compressive strength as much you are likely to impact the durability because this is the zone, the cover crete is a zone which is concerned with drying. When drying of the concrete structure happens, the water from the cover zone is basically trying to move out. If you do not do good curing, you do not result in good hydration of the concrete on the surface. If hydration does not happen, you are not going to have the reduction in porosity and permeability that is typically associated or accompanied with hydration. So, very important curing is done to improve quality of the cover concrete and that is the message that you have to take wherever you go. Many people think curing is done for several reasons. If you go to the site, people talk about curing being done for 
strength okay at least that makes sense many people say curing is done to re reduce the heat of the concrete now if you if concrete is hot you're pouring water in it you're doing a damage because it's going to crack the concrete it's not to reduce the heat it's to ensure that concrete has a moist environment so that water inside concrete can interact with the cement and lead to hydration right so all kinds of reasons people give you outside but the primary reason that is important from an engineering perspective is the fact that you are protecting the cover concrete making the cover concrete less permeable and that will lead to an improved durability of a concrete structure now ideally we want as long curing as possible 28 days or more we do ideal curing for 28 days in the lab but in the field it's simply not something that is achievable so at least we should ensure 7 days of good quality curing right good curing for a slab implies you are ponding the top surface like having a water pond maintained on the top of the slab so that the evaporation will happen only of that water the water inside the concrete will not evaporate okay or alternatively you can cover the surface with the polythene sheet at early on in the life cycle of the concrete structure when the concrete is not going to be water cured because concrete has just been placed or finished after that to protect the water from drying out you are not going to be pouring extra water because that may tend to wash out the surface because concrete is not fully set or hardened yet but still at this stage you can still protect the concrete by covering it with a polythene sheet very often for slabs this is a very important thing to do to protect against plastic shrinkage cracking okay now you can see on our sites curing quality is typically very poor you see this hessian that is covering the concrete surface but it's not at all wet it's dry completely dry okay and you can imagine that if it's dry there's no water supplied from the outside environment so water is going to start drying out from the concrete and you're going to get very poor curing again same same story here okay so when you are using hessian or jute cloth covering on the concrete surface it has to be kept wet all the time only then it will protect the concrete and provide sufficient curing to the concrete so there have been several large scale studies undertaken mostly by the portland cement association in the us and these articles are available for everybody to see and very clearly it shows in laboratory studies when you do long term curing so if you do moist curing for the entire time the strength continues to increase for any concrete okay because hydration will continue to happen the strength will continue to increase but marginal enhancement will happen over 28 days it's not going to be very large after 28 days so in air after 28 days moist curing you have achieved a strength at 28 you still increase a little bit and then there's not much of an increase that you see after that if you cure for 7 days you at least reach a certain level of the 28 day strength and then you can see that the marginal enhancement only is there but if you have curing which is done in air entire time that means without any supply of external moisture you don't develop that same extent of strength these are in cubes but if you take the same example i showed you earlier of a concrete column maybe your column capacity is not going to be severely impacted if you don't do curing as far as strength is concerned your column capacity which depends a lot on the hardcrete may not get significantly affected but nobody is going to listen to you on site if your concrete cubes are not getting cured people are going to obviously say that it's not acceptable right so you need to ensure that you provide a curing system which can take care of concrete at least until 70 to 80 percent of strength has been gained by the concrete so we typically follow site curing for seven days because most concretes that are designed with modern cements tend to gain up to 70 percent of their strength by that time problem is when you start using mineral additives like fly ash which slow down the reaction your strength gain may not be achieved in seven days up to 70 percent so you may have to prolong the curing by a few days and that is very important as an engineer to understand because it is affecting your productivity and economy for sure but the investment of this longer term curing for mineral additive based concrete is going to extend your service life significantly and that's something which we'll talk about later okay 
But these days, water obviously is not available, right? Because of lack of water, good quality water, because what is the requirement for curing water in terms of its composition or in terms of its uh, 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 purity? Curing water, there is no special requirement. It is the same as mixing water, which is potable water, water that can be drunk basically. Potable means water that can be kept in a pot for drinking, right? That is exactly the type of water for curing also. That good quality water is not easily available on sites these days. So, we have to increasingly shift towards curing compounds. So, the other aspect that you will come across a lot more in the future is this water footprint. Okay. Water footprint is going to be a reality in the future just as carbon footprint is becoming a reality now. So, materials will have to be evaluated for the amount of water that they take up during the construction. Now, here again use of water reducers is a great option to reduce the amount of water in your system and obviously the use of curing compounds is important from the perspective of reducing curing water. So, how much you I mean where do you think more water is used, mixing or curing? Possibly in curing, right? You need much more water during curing. So, the amount of water saved during curing will be tremendous. Okay? Now, with curing compounds, one has to be very careful about the type of chemical that is there as a curing compound. You could get different types of compounds. One is wax based, you can get resin based or water based. Okay? The efficiency of these curing compounds will vary depending upon the type of curing compound that you have. Interestingly, the type of test that you do to assess the efficiency can also affect the result. I will talk about that in just a minute. Most commonly you will find that the efficiency is only about 70 percent. What do you mean by that? Curing compound is only producing 70 percent of the properties that water curing does. But that is only because application strategies are not properly devised and people often do not follow the recommendations of the curing compound manufacturers. What would be a good value of efficiency you think for curing to be justified to be used with curing compounds? More than 90 percent, yeah, if you have 90 percent or more should be satisfiable, right? You cannot get 100 percent obviously, it is not possible, but anything more than 90 percent should be good. So, you need to ensure that you have the mechanisms and the methodologies in place to measure this efficiency. I okay. will talk about that challenge in a little bit of time. So, here you can see this spray is being applied on the surface curing compound. There is also this roller which is actually applying or uh, curing compound on the surface. So, different ways of doing that you can either brush it, roll it or spray it various ways of actually applying curing compounds. Application has to be done uniformly obviously because it has got to cover the entire surface. It has to be done at the right time. If the concrete has the surface sheen of bleed water, your curing compound is not going to be effective. It needs to have almost a drying surface, not a completely dry bone dry surface, but a drying surface. So, the bleed water has to evaporate and then you apply your curing compound on top and that will stick to the surface well. Application rate has to be as per uh, the suggestion of the manufacturer, sometimes not just in one coat, but you may have several coats of the curing compound to be applied. Uh, there are guidelines in ASTM C309 which need to be properly followed while applying these curing compounds. Now, when you cure small specimens versus curing larger specimens, the efficiency of curing is quite different, right? In large specimens where volume is huge, the surface area to volume ratio is quite small. In small specimens like cubes, surface area to volume ratio is going to be high. Okay. So, the curing efficiency if you are testing on cubes versus testing on a slab for instance, your answers may be quite different. So, you have to be careful about how you check the curing efficiency. The relative influence of curing on the properties varies with the size of the specimen. Okay, influence of curing reduces as the size of specimen increases. So, be careful about how you establish this as efficiency. I will talk about that again. That is why if you use cubes, it may not be accurate to assess the curing efficiency. For instance, if you take a cube at one day you demold, take the cube out, we typically put that inside a 
moist curing chamber or under water until the age of testing. Instead of that, take the same cube and start spraying the curing compound on all sides and then store it in the air dry condition. Then use it at 28 days. That will be the efficiency, efficiency test done on cubes. But if you do a slab, for instance, if you have a large slab that you cast and you spray the top surface of the curing compound, your drying is only happening through one surface. All the other parts of the slab are protected. In a cube, all six surfaces drying is likely to happen. So, the amount of surface available for drying as a function of the volume in a cube is quite different as compared to what you have in a slab or a beam. So, in such a case, you need to be extremely careful about how you take those results, how you compare those results. So, it is easier or probably more justifiable to cast slabs and test the cores periodically. So, you cast a slab, cover the top surface using, using curing compounds and then use cores from time to time to assess the strength of the concrete. That may be a better approach. Again, the efficiency will depend not just on this aspect, but also on the type of compound that is being used. And efficiency can also vary based on time of applications, okay. when you apply. When in most cases, what you find is on sites, people disappear after finishing the top surface and they come back only the next day to start spraying water or curing. By that time, usually it is already too late if you are looking at the modern concretes which have a lot of tendency for plastic shrinkage cracking. So, applying curing compounds early enough is absolutely essential. So, we have done several studies on curing compounds. So, there are two studies that are reported here in this uh, uh, slide deck. One is the study done by a student where they looked at uh, the use of curing compounds for tunnel segments. These were tunnel segments that were being uh, looked at. So, here cement weight is about 410 kilograms, fly ash is 70 and you see that the water cement ratio is roughly 160 by about 480, so about 0.33. So, these are concretes that are intended to develop a significantly high strength. Okay. Four different types of curing compounds were used. One was water based, resin based, wax based, and acrylic based. Now, what happens is your ease of application also varies depending upon the type of curing compound you have. Water based curing compounds are easy to apply, right? And sometimes you also need to worry about the aesthetics, what kind of surface texture or what kind of surface sheen is provided when you use these curing compounds. So, th those were also compared in this case as you can see from the table here. Interestingly, based on the application, what you saw here is that the lab application or curing in the lab versus ambient curing as you can clearly see, right, after application of the curing compound. The difference here is that the lab is at a temperature of 25 degrees control temperature and 65 percent relative humidity. Ambient environmental temperature is varying between 33 and 43 degrees Celsius, much higher temperatures. Okay. What you do see is actually the ambient is producing a higher strength increasingly in all the cases and that is just the effect of the external temperature because lab temperatures are lower, external temperatures are higher, so you get higher strengths. Now, Look at the strengths achieved at 3 days with the 4 different types of curing compounds varying to some extent. At 28 days, 49, 58, 51, 48. So, this here the resin based compound certainly is the one that leads to most effective water curing. Efficiency has not been reported here, but the efficiency essentially compared to water curing for the resin based compound which was used here was nearly about 85 to 86 percent. That is what is reported in this study. In another study, we worked with, okay, uh, not 85, 70 to 86, uh, 85 to 86 for the resin based compound, but for the other compounds it was lower, right. For instance, for the acrylic based or for the uh, water based curing compounds it was much lower. In the other study, we studied uh, both applications. One was a study on mortar cubes where we applied the curing compound on the cubes. We then extended the study to concrete where we actually studied reinforced concrete slabs. Only the top surface curing compound was applied and then concrete cylinders were cored from the slab at different ages for the testing. Okay. 
these are the different types of curing compounds used wax emulsion based resin solvent based and resin emulsion based curing compounds and we also had a site based curing that is 7 days with wet hessian cloth and then exposed to air and then also just air curing right after finishing completely air cured okay and you can see that uh, the water binder ratio is very high 0.55 binder content is 340 so expected strength is about 25 to 30 mpa that range strength so in this case the comparative data is provided for the strength and for durability okay of course there's some problem with this one data point here for some reason we were not able to uh, really figure out why that happened but if you look at the 7 day strength comparison the air curing is at 28.6 the 7 day hessian curing is at 29.2 not a major difference right not a major difference wax based curing compound is not producing a strength which is similar to the resin based or resin based solvent or resin based emulsion okay so there are differences at 3 days at 7 days interestingly at 1 year you see a very different performance of this resin based system you are only reaching 38.7 in this case 41 in the case of the wax based compound you have the resin based emulsion seems to be producing a strength which is almost comparable to what you get in air curing and 7D Hessian cloth curing. The interesting part here is that just doing the air curing did not seem to affect your overall strength so much. But what about durability properties? Again, interestingly, in this study, the durability properties are again not that badly affected when you do. Lab 28 day lab values versus the 7 day hessian or only when you see air curing the water softivity is increased tremendously the chloride migration coefficient is also increased but not significantly all the curing compound applied concrete seem to indicate a much higher migration coefficient in indicating poorer durability i don't know what would be the reason for this is a very difficult thing to understand because if you look at the water softivity they are seemingly producing a better concrete as compared to your air cured material but in terms of chloride characteristics you are producing much different results now of course there is a lot more detail that is required to be understood here with respect to the type of tests that that are done and what kind of specimen conditioning actually is done to get the test method uh, in many instances you need to dry the specimen before doing the test in other tests like the migration coefficient test you need to actually saturate it before you do the test so there are various different uh, conditions or preconditioning regimes that are used for durability testing and because of that it becomes difficult to ascertain the overall impact here of the use of curing compounds so again this study was essentially not very conclusive and that's what you'll find in many of the field studies also when you get reports from your sites they will also tell you all kinds of results with curing compounds so this is one aspect of research that still needs to be done to some extent to really get truly accurate data which can reflect the efficiency of these compounds okay application strategies have to be worked out application has to be done properly at the right time you need to also use the right type of elements to be prepared to check the efficiency of these compounds Again, not going too much into these results because they were not really giving a clear indication of what the expected performance could be. Right, so uh, very brief treatment, but again, something that you have to keep in mind because these days, increasingly, we are having to rely on curing compounds. So, some methods of understanding efficiency on site are absolutely essential. So, I will stop this uh, lecture with this. I would like to acknowledge, of course, again, Dr. Pillai and one of our joint master students Satak Surana who had done work on curing compounds. Some references for you to look at one is uh, this paper by uh, Vandana Padmanabhan and Professor Getu uh, this is on spray on curing compounds and then the other paper uh, there were two papers by Satak based on his work and those have much more detailed assessment of the results that have been provided here in that simple table right.